In this presentation, Francois will take us to the next two churches, Pergamon and Thyatira. At the end of this lecture, see if you can recall the main messages to these two churches. Please continue, Francois. In our previous lecture, we visited the churches of Ephesus and Smyrna. During the lecture, we discovered that God not only spoke to people of long ago, He also speaks to you and me today. Please join me on a visit to the third church, the Church of Pergamon. The modern name of this ancient city is called Bergama. I was impressed in more than one way when I visited the ancient Acropolis at Pergamon. Great historic and prophetic events transpired right here. When you study the prophetic time slot of this early church, you discover that it runs from AD 313 to 538. Can you still remember from the study of Daniel 7 what happened in 538 AD? In this very same year, the little horned power received official recognition from Emperor Justinian, whose column you're looking at right now. In our studies from the book of Daniel, we also discovered that the little horn represents the medieval church, the papacy. It's quite an experience to walk amongst the ruins of the heathen temples on the Acropolis here at Pergamum. When you study the messages to the seven churches in the book of Revelation, you discover God's amazing love for this apostate church. He praises the church of Pergamum for her good deeds. But you know, God is too kind not to tell us to mend our wicked ways. Because a sinful lifestyle and sinful thought patterns destroy people, He offers us His help. He calls us to repentance and offers to break the chains of sin that bind us. Two thousand years ago, a messenger was sent from Patmos. A letter was written in love by the aged Apostle John. When the church members of Pergamum read the message, they knew John was addressing their shortcomings. They understood his admonitions. Some of them repented and were saved. Others rejected the message and they were lost. As I was walking through the ruins of this ancient church, I was thinking of myself. How do I react when someone reminds me of my shortcomings? How do I react when the word of God tells me where I go wrong? May God help us to heed every word of correction that comes to us. Let's listen carefully and prayerfully and attentively to this message. Revelation chapter 2 verses 12 and 13 To the angel of the church in Pergamum write, these are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city where Satan lives. Why does the Bible call Pergamum the throne of Satan? In order to explain it, I have to take you to the site of the ancient library. We are walking on historic ground. At one stage, this library boasted a collection of 200,000 volumes. These books tell us that the Babylonian priests brought their degraded satanic religion to Pergamum. As one historian puts it, Pergamum was the headquarters of Satan's religion. I want to assure you that God himself ordained the birth of the signs of archaeology in order to help us understand the Bible a little better. Now we know why this city was called the throne of Satan. When the Persians captured Babylon, the priests, that's the Babylonian priests, revolted and fled. They came to Pergamum where they continued their practice of demonic spiritualistic heathen rites. The Roman high priest that officiated at this temple called himself Pontifex Maximus, which means the greatest bridge builder. And now for a bit of a shock. When King Attalus III of Pergamum bequeathed his kingdom to the Romans, the Babylonian cult was also transferred to Rome. That included the title Pontifex Maximus, the keys and the vestments. 
They were all included in this transfer. What an interesting transfer from Babylon to Pergamum, from Pergamum to Rome. History tells us that the pagan high priest of Rome was so pleased with the title of Pontifex Maximus that he made it his own. But then pagan Rome came to an end. What happened to this blasphemous title? It did not get lost. It is still in Rome. Here you see it in the foyer of St. Peter's. Pontifex. Pont means bridge. And factio means I make. The Latin word maximus means greatest. One of our most dangerous sinful tendencies is to become the greatest. Jesus, on the other hand, became the least. He became a humble slave of my needs. So the title that used to belong to the Babylonian high priest eventually became the title not only of the emperors but also of the pontiff of Rome. Actually, this title only belongs to Christ. Only he can build a bridge over the great chasm that sin caused between God and man. Archaeologists transported the entire temple of Zeus that used to be here on the Acropolis at Pergamum. Let us make our way to Berlin where you can view the greatest exhibition of a heathen temple in the world. Visiting the archaeological museum at Pergamum was one of the highlights of my life. You are looking at the complete temple of Zeus where the ancients of Pergamum worshipped. If we walk a little closer, we will be able to see the motifs on the frieze. This is a heathen artist's impression of the gods in conflict. What a revelation! John saw this in vision and he calls Pergamum the place where Satan has his throne. They also found an inscription where Zeus is mentioned as the saviour. The devil, of course, also wants to be a saviour. You're looking at a fulfilment of prophecy concerning the ancient church of Pergamum. When you look at world history from the time of Constantine in the 4th century and Justinian in the 6th century, you discover it was a very, very dark period. In the vision of the seven seals of Revelation 6 verses 5 and 6, John sees a black horse that also represents this dark period. They found this emblem of an entwined snake in the temple of Asclepius at Pergamum. Let's ask John to tell us more about his message to this specific church. Revelation chapter 2 verses 14 and 15 Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food, sacrificed to idols, and by committing sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. The first accusation against the church of Pergamum is very interesting. The teachings of Balaam led the Israelites to commit sexual immorality. King Balak of Moab asked Balaam, a prophet from Mesopotamia, to come and curse Israel. But when he opened his mouth to curse them, he blessed them. Balak offered Balaam even greater rewards if he would harm Israel, so the apostate prophet used Moabite women to lure Israel into the sin of adultery. The Old Testament prophets used the term adultery to describe the wickedness of God's people whenever they entered into a religious and political alliance with the pagan nations of their day. Now how did the Roman Catholic Church commit spiritual adultery during this time? Did they absorb pagan practices into their belief system? Yes, they did. Wary, the church historian, writes in his book Church History, page 54, Christianity had now become popular, and a large proportion, perhaps a large majority of those who embraced it, only assumed the name, received the rite of baptism, and conformed to some of the external ceremonies of the church, while at heart and in moral character they were as much heathen as they were before. Referring to the Pergamum period, one author writes, 
most of the Christians at least consented to lower their standard and a union was formed between Christianity and paganism. This comes from the book The Great Controversy by E.G. White, page 43. Some time ago, Newsweek carried an article which discussed the religious and political change of this period. Constantine became revered as the equal of the apostles and the vice-regent of God on earth, blending the temporal powers of Caesar with the spiritual authority of the church. He rules supreme over both church and state. Strolling through the ruins of Pergamum, I thought of another interesting discovery that archaeologists made here some time ago. Here at the Karnak Temple in Egypt, Pharaoh Shishak mentions the names of the Israelite cities he captured. One of them is called Sukkot, that he captured during his campaign against King Rehobiam of Jerusalem. Ancient Sukkot is today called Deir Allah. It was here that archaeologists discovered clay fragments that contained curses allegedly pronounced by the biblical prophet Balaam. You know, it's discoveries like these that give me greater confidence in the messages of the Bible. Let us look at the other accusations against Pergamum concerning the Nicolaitans. It says in Revelation 2.15, Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. In his letter to the Ephesians, John congratulated them for hating the practices of the Nicolaitans. But here we find that the church of Pergamum actually held on to their teaching. Can you still remember from the letter to the Ephesians what the Nicolaitans believe? They said, faith in Jesus releases one from obeying the law of God. Did the Catholic Church abolish one of the Ten Commandments during this time slot? Yes, they did. Do they teach that faith in Christ releases one from obeying one of the commandments? Yes, they do. Question. Which is the Sabbath day? Answer. Saturday is the Sabbath day. Question. Why do we observe Sunday instead of Saturday? Answer. We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Catholic Church transferred the solemnity from Saturday to Sunday. This comes from the Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine, 1957 edition, page 50. While visiting the ancient site of Pergamum, I thought of the final appeal that John made to this historic church, the Church of Rome, as well as an appeal to you and me, the New Testament Church. Revelation chapter 2 verse 17, He who has an ear... Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him that overcomes, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give him a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to him who receives it. Spectators who sat in this huge amphitheater could hear every word from the letter that was read to them from the speaker down below. You and I are also spectators in the amphitheater of life and God is speaking to us. This is what he says, If you love me, keep my commandments. Can you hear his voice? If we allow him to make us his obedient children, we will feed on him, the heavenly manner, in a more meaningful way. There is much greater joy in obedience than in disobedience. We've just arrived at our next archaeological site called Thyatira. Let's read the message to them from the pen of John the Apostle. Revelation chapter 2 verses 18 and 19 To the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance and that you are now doing more than you did at first. By the way, this is the only place in the book of Revelation where the title Son of God is being used. Why? Well, during this specific prophetic time period, the Middle Ages, the man of sin theologically replaced the Son of God. Let's continue reading. 
Verses 20 to 29. Nevertheless, I have this against you. You tolerate that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast on a bed of suffering and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches hearts and minds and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to a teaching and have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets, I will not impose any other burden on you. Only hold on to what you have until I come. To him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He will dash them to pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my father. I will also give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. In Revelation chapter 2 verse 21 we read these sad words. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. The Jesu- One very important fact about the city, however, helps us to understand the book of Revelation a little better. Thyatira was famed for dyeing cloth, especially red and purple. Acts 16 verse 14 confirms this archaeological fact. It says, One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshipper of God. Tradition has it that she originally carried the gospel message from Philippi to Thyatira. But there was another lady in the city that was called Jezebel. Unfortunately, the church tolerated her. Historians tell us that she led God's people into apostasy. Now for an important question. Will the spiritual antitypical Jezebel, the Catholic Church, ever repent? In Revelation chapter 2 verse 21 we read these sad words. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. The Jezebel element in historic Thyatira never repented. And we cannot expect the Jezebel element in the Catholic Church to repent either. The prophetic time slot for Thyatira began at AD 538, when the papacy received official recognition from Justinian. It ended in 1563 at the Council of Trent, when the Church officially placed the authority of tradition above that of Scripture. Individual Catholics may still come to repentance, but the Church at large will never repent. She had the opportunity to do so during the time of the Reformation, but she decided not to repent. The reformers brought the beautiful message of sola scriptura, sola gratia, to the spiritual leaders of Rome. History brings us the tragic account of their persistent rejection of these truths. Red and purple were not only prominent colors in ancient Thyatira, they also became a prominent part of the attire of the medieval church. What an interesting similarity! I have given it time to repent, says the Son of God. Did he send Thyatira enough warnings before he finally rejected her? Yes, he did. Revelation chapter 2 verse 28 I will also give him the morning star. This is a reference to the Reformation which proclaimed Jesus as the only bright and morning star. Foremost among the early reformers was John Wycliffe, also called the Morning Star of the Reformation. Savonarola also urged the church to repent. How did Rome treat these messengers of light, these morning stars? History tells us they silenced their voices and burned them at the stake. 
Did God ever stop sending messengers to call the Catholic Church to repentance? No. When you read the history of the Reformation, you stand amazed at the many voices that called this church back to the Bible and its principles. On October 31, 1517, Martin Luther, the Augustinian monk, nailed 95 theses on the door of the Wittenberg Church. God was calling his Catholic children to repentance. Luther pled with his beloved church to repent, but his God-sent message was rejected. Luther and Calvin had no intentions of leaving their church. All they wanted to see was repentance and a return to God's word. But when the church failed to repent and failed to return to the Bible as the only rule of faith, they were forced to leave. Because of his great love for people, he kept on pleading with the Church of Rome to repent. The Reformation spread like wildfire. The emperor, kings, leading statesmen and church officials demanded the council of both Catholics and Protestants to consider needed reform. Finally, the council was convened at Trent. It lasted for 18 years, from 1545 till 1563 AD. The majority of Protestants were not adverse to the reunion with the Catholic Church if Reformation could be effected. But the Jezebel element in the Church of Rome, Thyatira, would not heed the call to repent. The Reformed messages were rejected and stigmatized as pestilential heresy. I gave a space to repent. God is a God of patience and of tears. He weeps because people reject the call to repent. God was extremely long-suffering with the papacy. Why? Because he died for them and he does not want anybody to be lost. A Catholic author says, Finally, at the last opening of the 18th of January 1562, Council of Trent, their last scruple was set aside. The Archbishop of Regu made a speech in which he openly declared that tradition stood above Scripture. This comes from Canon and Tradition, Dr. J. H. Holtzman, page 263. At Thyatira, archaeologists found a Greek inscription from the time when the letter was written. It is a quotation from Revelation chapter 2, verse 29. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The prophetic Thyatira period corresponds with the period of the pale horse of Revelation chapter 6 verses 7 and 8. Pale stands for death, the death of the church of Rome, their spiritual death. Is there a Jezebel in my life? Do I tolerate unkindness to God and to my fellow man? Just before leaving Thyatira, I had a little talk with the Lord. He has given me time to repent. Did I really make good use of it? Is there some sin in your life that is harming you and breaking God's heart? He has given you time to repent. Please, let it never be said of you and me. I have given them time to repent, but they are unwilling. Rather let it be said, They have repented, and I have given them Jesus, the bright morning star. Thank you, Francois. In our next presentation, we will visit the last three of the seven churches. Don't miss it.